text to make sure that you only get the 30 minute version tonight. So this came out of a discussion in, in the PDX planning chat and I realized, oh, that is literally what my supervisor said to me when we were facing a big problem about two years ago. But before we do that, I, this is me. For the people who are watching online, this is what I look like. I typically do have that cat sitting in front of me. That's tough. She is officially the worst, and she assists with much of my documentation. Uh, I am a little unusual in today's economy. I am actually not that active on social media. So if you want to get in touch with me, I highly recommend use that email address or just come find me afterwards. I could tell you where to find me online, but it's all locked down. So I'm strange, I know. So what do I do? I'm just gonna let you all stare at this for a moment. And let's see who cringes. My job is to prevent this from happening. I saw this sign in Eastern Oregon and I thought, I have just proven my value. This is, this is why I do what I do. And so in my day job, I am part of a team of four and we knew that we were a little busy. We knew that we had a lot to do. And I eventually put together a query that told us just exactly what was going on. And that's the number, 727,000 words for four people. That's a lot to maintain. And we were starting to run into a problem. We had an aging Drupal 7 application that for reasons, even though we are a Drupal shop, we were essentially on an island and we needed to be able to do our jobs regardless of what the platform was on. And we had approximately a thousand pages that we needed to update asynchronously at any point in time. They all contained HTML markup buried in the word, in with the words themselves. And we knew that this was not tenable in the long term. And the question kept coming up. We don't know where we're gonna go, but we know we can't stay here. And so my supervisor said, Amy, you need to come up with a plan. Please, please find some answers. We don't know what our options are. Go find them. Come tell us what we can do. Tell us what the options are, and then tell us how to get there. So step one, by the way, this is Hawaii. Uh, this is the approach to the, the summit at Mauna Kea. Highly recommend it. Don't recommend the altitude sickness, but totally recommend the view. So step one for any, any project like this, figure out where you are. Don't make any moves until you understand what you're dealing with. And so I asked myself, what, what do we care about? What is important to us? We are a company that relies on tr issue tracking in JIRA. We knew that for compliance reasons, shout out to the, the compliance writer in the audience here, that some of our documentation, we literally needed to provide line by line audience of who approved this? Where did this come from? And as I was saying to her earlier, did anyone talk to legal about this sentence before we let it go out in the wild? Because this was a terrible idea. And we thought that going to a Git repository was probably going to be the way, the truth, and the light for us. But we weren't sure and we didn't know. All we knew is that well, where we're going to go, but we can't stay here. And we liked the idea of being able to share as much of our workflow as possible with our developers because if they understood the tools that we were using they were more likely to be sympathetic and empathetic to our needs and all this by the way with minimal budget and support by others so of course we had to figure it all out ourselves so thus the preferably not hosted here 
because we, we knew that we needed to hand off the finished product to someone else to do the hosting. That was just table stakes for us. So started looking around, asked myself, what can you do? And this was where I wanted to make sure that I put myself out into the community to make myself available as a resource, not because I am an expert, but purely because I survived the process. We didn't really know what our options were. And we felt so lost. We've since figured out that not a lot of people have been taking this approach just yet. And when we started looking closely at Write the Docs, we noticed that there were really two candidates. I've since learned that there was a third. I've included it up here in a specific order to imply we didn't know about it at the time. My research was in fact insufficient. But from our perspective, it looked like the two major options were either going to be restructured text and markdown. And I've since learned that ASCII doc is also supported. And I left a blank there to make clear that there may be other solutions. Do not take my word or the word of a slide that you saw at an, a very nice gathering that says, these are the only options. There are probably more. But we started focusing very quickly on just restructured text and markdown because those seem to be the two most plausible options for a team like us. And so we had to make a decision. Therefore, I made a decision. It might not be the most well-reasoned solution, but I am willing to argue for it. Restructured text. And I've had to defend this decision a lot in, I would say, the last 18 months or so. And what you see underneath there is exactly the question that I got over and over. But this is hard. Why, why did you pick the one that's hard? Amy, this, this is an actual quote from writers. And so this is why. Structured semantic markup, remember that I said that, and familiarity from our, with our devs. They, if they've worked with Python, they've seen restructured text before. They may not like it, but they've seen it. And since it was one of the two formats that Read the Dots supported asterisk that I knew of, that seemed like the, those seemed like the two main options. It had to be one of those two. It felt mostly like Markdown, which I was familiar with. And then there was this thing that I found in the course of my research. I'm scrolling through pages and pages of, please forgive me for the phrase that I'm about to say, very dry documentation. And I noticed a description of checkable links. Wait a second, what do you mean? I, build my internal links a specific way, every time I do a local build, they're all going to be verified. Go on. This is intriguing to me. See also 700,000 words for people. Uh, we don't have time to do a lot of checking by hand. I need robots, period. So given that there's no such thing as a free lunch, what are the cons? Remember I said structured semantic markup? Restructured text. It has expectations. If you don't do things exactly the way that it expects, it's going to hurt. Restructured text has a, a very specific standard, unlike Markdown. Markdown has a lot of different flavors that are surprisingly similar, but you cannot guarantee from one program to the next that what, re what rendered correctly in one situation is going to render correctly in another. That was not cool for me. I needed to know that what I was doing was actually going to render the same every single time. And then there was the painful double transformation. If, if you start researching restructured text, you will run into this. Restructured text only lets you transform 
a piece of text one time unless you are doing it some really, really specific things that really hurt. The easiest example that I can give you is that if you want to put text in a link, you do not get to italicize it or bold it. You get to pick one. Pick one. This hurts. We, we had to go back and find solutions to get around this particular limitation. And we had to learn to let some of our style guide issues go because restructured text simply would not support it. But those beautiful, beautiful links, they made us happy. And we also understood as part of our migration that we were putting ourselves on an island. And I'll come back to this probably and rant slightly about it. Restructured text is not in use anywhere else in our company. Our, our support system uses Zendesk, which uses Markdown, which looks close, but isn't exactly the same. And our internal documentation is done in Confluence, which has a syntax that nobody else anywhere has. And that, that island is just not going to play well with anyone else ever. And so we knew that we were running this when we did this. We, we knew that if we picked a format that no one else was using, we ran the risk of getting what we needed while failing to get external contributions from teams other than our own. How'd we get there? So I'm curious, show of hands. How many of you winced when you saw this word on the screen? Anyone? I see one guy shaking his head a little bit. As an explanation, Pandoc is a very useful command line tool that will let you transform text from one markup language to another. It's very much a Swiss Army knife. You, you tell it, here is, here is your source file. This is the, the markup that you can expect, Pandoc. I would like you to generate a file in this format instead. So what we ended up doing, how we got us out of our hand basket, was to get some scripts written that pulled our old information, which was in the HTML format, out of the database, extracted into flat files, and then waved the magic pandoc wand over it and turn it into restructured text. So, man, oh, that's the, that's the bare bones of it. What does it actually take to move a thousand plus pages? And when you, I should also say, when you can't actually take the site down at all, it had to remain up at all times. And so we instituted a content freeze that lasted for about two weeks. And in an agile company, that's forever. We had developers yelling by the end of it, seriously, give us updates. You're, you're pushing out new code. We need release notes now. What do you mean we can't publish anything for two weeks? This is a terrible idea. So as soon as we had a stable base of content, we had this 1,000 pages essentially frozen in amber, so frantically running stuff through Pandoc. For those of you who are watching remotely, I'm snapping my fingers. And then we have this giant pile of files, and then we have to reconstruct a table of contents out of nothing because Pandoc, Pandoc doesn't know. Pandoc is a script that generates output from what you tell it. It has no idea how to structure your content into a, a directory tree that makes sense to a human. And so we got that done. We got a, a, a nice table of contents, that hurt, by the way. And then we discovered, oh dear, we forgot something. We forgot something big. One of the things that Restructured Text offers you is the ability to put custom labels atop any subheading. And that, those checkable links that I mentioned, they're absolutely great. When you're building an, an HTML page for documentation, you can give ID tags 
to subheadings so that someone can link into the into the page and have it be a nice short fragment of pound sign setup, pound sign admin, something like that on different pages. In restructured text, every subheading has to be unique across your entire document set. There is no pound admin. There is dev desktop admin UI. For those of you who can't see me in the screen, my face is calming right now. And so we had to go through a thousand pages of documentation to figure out unique subheadings for all of those subheaders across all of the documentation set. We had no idea that we were about to run into this. So if I just saved you a few days worth of work, you're welcome. Glad I could help. So we had to clean all of that up. I learned to love them eventually because once you change over to linking with custom labels and restructured text, you can move a subheading from page to page and you don't have to change any links. Done. It's kind of really, but getting there really, really hurt. And once we got those links converted into testable formats, every time that we ran a build locally, we could see what was broken. And between you, me, the internet, and everyone who watches this recording later on, I'm going to tell you the first time that I ran a build, I believe there were 8,500 issues. I closed my laptop, went into another room, and had a cry. And then I came back and got to work. Turns out 4,000 of them were fixed by two lines of code, and things got better. But that first build where I watched everything just explode and turn red, I have totally misled my team. What have I done? Why did I choose this? The answer was sustainability. We suffered a great deal during this transition. It was hard. And I, I want to make sure that I cast this appropriately for someone who is considering doing a migration like this. It can hurt. It hurt for us. Was it worth it? Yes, eventually. I would say the first six months, no, wasn't. I honestly questioned my, my choice on almost a daily basis. And the reason I wanted to, to have this conversation with people is because our migration was not 100% successful. The, the degree of success is greatly determined by the point of view of the person who is asking. From the, from the perspective of our team, the team of four, we would call this an outright success. We managed to claw back some measure of sustainability by dint of choosing a good tool, by choosing a good language, by choosing something that allowed us to offload a lot of the cognitive, cognitive load of maintenance to robots instead of ourselves. But it came at a cost. See also the hearts. We, we loved that it integrated well with Git. It was nice to have that no longer be an issue because prior to the migration, it totally was. Our system had no conversation whatsoever with Jira. And now we make a pull request, it shows up at the ticket. It's like magic. But the, the external contributions that we hoped for by switching over from a database system that was locked down to a Git repository that more people could contribute to didn't really materialize in the way that we hoped, purely because restructured text is hard. And restructured text is not something that many of our employees are familiar with. A few of them have taken the time to learn some of it, but not all of them, not as many as we would have liked. And so I feel like if I, if I give you nothing else from this presentation, except the cautionary tale of choose with care, choose not just for your own team, but choose for your, choose for your audience as well. I still think I would have made the same decision 
I think I probably would have undertaken a harder PR campaign to make clearer why we made the choice that we did. Because the people who have contributed to our, to our repository, they get it. Oh, you mean I can know for certain that I didn't just break things? Yeah, yeah, you totally can. But, the, but it's hard really deterred a lot more people than we were expecting. And if I can make sure that the people who come after me are a little more prepared to defend their choice publicly and say why, then I've done you a service. So yeah, we survived. We're still a team of four, we're still managing. And we learned a lot. And I would like to make sure that anyone who comes after us in, in a path like this has an opportunity to reach out to someone and ask questions because we didn't really know anybody at the time who was doing anything like this. We, we came to write the docs this past year and started talking about it and discovered, wow, you mean other people want to do this? You have Questions? That's cool. I didn't expect that. So I'm going to close with one of my weirdest moments in China. Just don't wait. And I see that Mo just read it. This, this was me in Shanghai staring across the street and asking myself, am I capable of reading? Does that say what I think it says? I have no explanation for this shot. I really don't. But Amy at domesticat.net is how to reach me. And I want to throw in one bonus tip for those of you who are considering taking an approach like this. I can't speak to what the other tools are out there, but know that if you are considering moving to a Git repository for your, for your docs, there are tools out there that will help you lint your, your work. English language linters actually exist and they're really cool. The thing you want to search for, I, I see you going for your pen over there. Thank you. That was super gratifying. It's called Vail, V-A-L-E. It's actually written by someone here in Portland. And being able to write automated tests for our documentation, such as these words, not even once. No, 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 no. Or Oxford comma, always, always, always. <laughs> You're welcome, Mo. Speaking from an editorial point of view, that's part of how we found sustainability. I deliberately kept it out of the slides this time because talking about linting in a DOCSIS code approach is an entirely different topic, but I want to, I want to make everyone aware, if you're considering an approach like this, these tools exist. You just have to ask the right questions. Come find us. Because they're really cool and we totally want to talk about them. So that being said, ooh, 24 minutes. I did good. Questions? It's a dodgy person in the front. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for your talk. I feel like... I was, I feel like I'm at an author talk at Powell's bookstore because the way you read your story, I felt, wow, it's amazing. So, as a, someone who's very new or who is, has zero knowledge about boxes code, and who's only, who's the first thing that comes to their mind when they hear the word lifting, is that roller thing that you use to attack your off your body or something. Hey. Can you explain it in the cost of the Sure. So to repeat the question for people who may have not been able to hear it, Mo is asking if I can explain what the concept of linting is and what it does. Linting is common in the programming world, but it is less common in, in English language writing. And I'm going to give you an example why. Everybody's read Jabberwocky. What spell checker 
can get you through Jabberwocky. Not a single one, because there's, there are practically no actual English words in Jabberwocky. But there are, there's a really famous sentence by Noam Chomsky, Chomsky, I think Paul. The idea was to put together a sentence that the individual words all made sense, but the sentence had no meaning whatsoever. I cannot remember what the sentence is. I should have anticipated somebody was going to ask me that question. <clears throat> Linters can't really do that for you either. It can't, Linters cannot look for writing that makes sense. But what you can do, if, if you can write a simple test to look for things that either should exist or should never exist, like look for misspelled words or look for the absence of Oxford commas. You can run automated tests against your files to look for exceptions that should be flagged. And Veil, which we use, allows us to flag uh, three different levels of concern. There are suggestions, which are mostly us flagging is are those lovely non-action verbs that you really shouldn't be using in your documentation. Also, the word that, which I, I have a coworker who overuses. Those we want to flag, but not reject the piece of work for. Then there are suggestions, which are a little more concerning, but we're not going to reject your work for it. I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my head, and I'm totally not coming up with one. The best example I can think of are suggestions for phrases that the Microsoft Style Guide suggests, consider using X instead of Y. We're not going to reject your work if you use the wrong word, but we're probably going to change it. And then there, there is the error level, such as Amy, you just used an internal term and you're trying to publish this in our public documentation. How about you don't do that? So there are certain words that we have our, our tests set up to say, nope, do not pass go, do not collect $200, do not ever put this in your documentation. And so those automated tests, that's what linting is, takes, they take some of the cognitive load off of the editor, which by the way, that's me, because we want to spend as, as much of my limited time as I can give to editorial work on the Jabberwocky questions, not the spelling questions, because everybody's got a spell checker. You want me focusing on style and tone, the kinds of things that a robot really can't look for. So the short answer to what is linting, what does it do? It allows us to automate away a lot of the simpler editorial work so that I can focus on the bigger, more pervasive issues. Okay, is that a sneeze or is that a question? I can't tell. Okay. <laughs> more questions, small amounts of snoring, Questions? So you said that the automated test is the linter. Are there other automated tests besides the Just that, that's sort of the yes and no. Uh, it's a complicated answer. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, everything would be a complicated answer. I'm going to run back over here and, and repeat the question. Uh, you were asking if there were other, question, uh, other tests aside from linters. The, there can be. Uh, linting is a type of testing. There, there can be other types of testing, but in this case, we are using linting to check for basic grammar style and, and word usage issues. You mentioned validating links. Is that another thing? Um, you mentioned our, uh, validating links. For us, link validation is done inside of restructured text because it offers the ref and doc functions for, for building links. So anytime that we do a build locally, 
every link that is built with either the ref or doc syntax is checked for validity. That's, that just comes baked in with the language. That was actually our number one reason for picking restructured text. Syntax validity or validates the It validates that the target exists, which is intensely valuable for us. I'm not familiar with restructured text. Is this a provided tool or do you write your own available scripts? Or that? He's asking, uh, does it provide tooling or did you build your own build scripts? There is a, a command line command that you can run. And I found it to be long and unwieldy and I got it wrong most of the time. So I wrote a couple of bash snippets to set a lot of the parameters so that I can just type the phrase, build the docs, boom, done. And if you ask me to reconstruct the Sphinx dash build flag, 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 output directory command, I'd have to go look it up. So your build is not a sequence of things like do the restructured test, do the enter, do the validation. It's just build. Correct. It is just build. More snoring. Easy questions. Oh, come on. <laughs> uh, my question, and then maybe a little backing up question. The question is, could you show us or explain us something about what the restructured texts are? Yes. And in the back of it, it seems to me you may be talking about something that's textable, like HTML. If we did all of our websites in raw HTML, raw JavaScript, and CSS, it would be much harder than if we use any of these human tools, visible tools, actually. Just allow you to do it. You don't have much power, but you can do these things. You don't have to know all of them. Is there no reason for the restrictions or they just don't need this? As she goes back to repeat the question, how would we sum that up in 10 words or less? <laughs> What's so hard about restructured What's so hard about restructured text? So to, to talk about the, the first part of what you were asking about building pages with HTML versus, versus doing something like this, I would actually advocate very strongly against mixing your style and your content purely because migrations happen. And if you've, if you've mixed your chocolate and your peanut butter that way, Separating them back out afterwards is really, really painful. We encountered that when we did the migration because we had some styling information buried in with our actual, the actual text of our documentation. And when we changed systems, we had to go clean all of that out because it, every one of the pages that had that, that mix up broke. Every one of them, every time. So what makes restructured text hard? For the most part, it is the rigidity. If you do anything that it doesn't like, it barfs spectacularly and in technicolor fashion. If you, for example, if you break a, a cell or a row in a table, if you don't space it out the way that it expects, it is, it is very spacing dependent vertically on the page. If you start a table, say three spaces over in the first line, the rest of the lines of the table must all absolutely line up with that first one or your entire table disappears. <laughs> it, it rewards the detail oriented and punishes the sloppy. What was that? Free spirited. Free spirited. <laughs> What's up, Bob? Um, how much uh, consideration do you give to accessibility while going through this project? Oh, you were going to ask that question. <laughs> Mo asked about accessibility. I'm going to give you a non answer which is true and is also not what you are looking for. 
and that is we we control the content we don't control the layout of the site the the layout the the things that wrap around the words that we write that is controlled by our ux and our marketing teams and so accessibility is actually their issue and not ours like and i said it's not the answer you're looking for but it is in fact the truthful answer uh, I know that there, there's a list of specs that we are expected to adhere to, and I know that if we find violations of those specs, we are supposed to report them to marketing and UX, but that is not actually on us to fix or handle. And to go back to your earlier question, can, can we see it? Complicated answer. You're gonna get used to hearing that from me. <laughs> I don't know, this is not my laptop that I am presenting on. This is Kristen's laptop. I do have my, my work laptop with me and I can pull up uh, our actual docs repo and I can show you how our build process works. But I know that if I, if I disconnect this laptop from the presentation, it's going to kill the recording. So <laughs> I'm happy to show you, but I know that if I do, it will come at the expense of the people who are listening and watching here. So stick around, happy to show you. <laughs> Sorry, everything with me is complicated answers. Welcome to working with Amy. So more, more questions. Hi, um, I have a question about how you and your team So this question was about our transition over to Git and what was it like? Complicated. I'm going to start charging money to myself every time I use that word. We found a very strong bifurcation in our team between the, the two people who came in with developer backgrounds, myself and my, my other senior writer, and our two junior writers. The senior writers who had had some experience with Git before professionally, we found the transition to be pretty easy. We, we followed the model of one branch per Jira ticket, try not to put too many, put pages that, let me start that again, put changes to too many pages in a single pull request because if you start stacking up lots and lots of changes in your pull request, your editor, otherwise known as me, gets really, really cranky and says, do you realize how long this is gonna take me to edit? Do you, do you need any of this this week? Just, just asking for a friend here. But our, our junior writers who came in as good writers, good technical writers, this was completely new to them. And this transition was rough on them. I, I don't want to dismiss that we, we took their entire workflow and we chucked it out the window. And that was hard. The first time we had to show our junior writers how to do a rebase on a branch, I thought she was going to quit. She had that look of, are you kidding me? What happened to hitting save? Is this my job now? Yes, yes, this is your job now. And I would say for reaching a point of comfort, the two senior writers, we were there in about three months. The junior writers, closer to a year. And it was, it was crunchy for a while. Did, did that cover all of your questions? Okay. And I wouldn't go back, but it also forced us to really drastically rethink how we post job openings for our team because we really can't support another Git newbie 
we, we need them to know how to do this because learning our style guide, learning our products, and learning your entire workflow is perhaps a little cruel. You know, go for one of the three. <laughs> Give them some strong base to start from. So I'm brand new to restructure text, and uh, I work a little bit again with some of our legacy, but I'm just basically pushing XML fonts to you. But is there a good resource that you guys use to learn basics and for restructured text, or is there a good learning resource out there for restructured text that we can a little bit more? So for those of you playing the home game, the question was, are there good resources else for, for restructured text? Kind of. <laughs> I found several that were decent and we managed to cobble together an understanding of the basic data structures that we would be using frequently. I'll, I'll ask out of curiosity, this, this will give me an idea of the kind of things that you've encountered so far. Have you run into the list table directive? Are you still drawing tables out by hand with, with all of the, the, the pipe symbols and, and such? No, I mean, we, we use CMS, but we have, a, we have legacy products that we have, so we have version control, and that's what we can do. Okay. Just basic version control. Gotcha. He says, no, they're, they're still using uh, legacy stuff. That's cool. I, I mentioned this particular directive because for me, it, it became a litmus test for how recent a, a tutorial was about restructured text. This was a directive that was introduced somewhat recently. And it's a major improvement in how to create tables in restructured text. As I mentioned before, spacing is super crucial. And if you get it wrong, you will pay. You will pay so hard. And list tables allow, it's a way of reducing the complexity somewhat. And most of the tutorials that I ran into didn't have it. If, if you can find something, that mentions that particular directive, congratulations, you now have my litmus test on whether or not I'm gonna keep reading on a particular piece of, of documentation or tutorial. I found a lot of cheat sheets written by other writers who had or chose to adopt RST, but please forgive me fellow documentarians for the thing that I am about to say. This spec for restructured text is both complete and dreadfully dry. I strongly recommend if you can find a, a cheat sheet from somewhere, start from there. It's a lot less intimidating than the tens and tens and tens and how many pages is this spec that goes into more detail than you ever possibly needed. A year later, we were still finding new things in that spec that we could implement. And if I can save you that pain, I will gladly do so. More questions? Uh, actually, questions. Um, since this is migration, how did you handle um, URL forwarding if URLs changed? Um, and also, are you doing um, Ajax transit? So these two questions for the home game folks were, how did we handle URLs as part of the transition? And are our docs translated? I'm gonna take part two first. Not yet. <laughs> we know it's coming. We have been told to expect that we will need to do a Japanese translation for at least one part of our docs. I have not heard the status of that project. I know that 
Sphinx, which is what restructured text uses, does support multiple languages. I cannot give you, I, I don't have information to give you, but I know it exists somewhere. I know it's doable. As for how to do, how we manage URLs, well, that's a three beer conversation. And for those of you who haven't met me before, I measure how long it ta takes to tell a story by the number of beers that it's gonna take to. Right yeah, <laughs> that's a three beer question. Uh, the, the one beer answer is poorly. The three beer <laughs> answer is we uncovered a lot of craft that we, we paid dearly for. The thing that I wish we had done prior to our migration, I wish that we had gone through all of our, our existing redirects and HD access, started warning people, we're gonna start turning some of these off because we had something like six plus years of stacked up redirects that 